Okay, CT dose. For some basic concepts, um, as CT technologists, we need to understand both the benefits and the risks of the technology that we're using. Um, and that's going to largely be to maximize the kind of the quality of the images that we're getting and to minimize the patient dose. So maximize the positive, minimize the negative. We're constantly balancing these things out. Um, there's always kind of two large kind of broad components that we're thinking about when we think about patient dose. Um, first is just the appropriate patient selection. Um, now this is something, if we look in our book page, what is it? 165, the text does a good job of pointing out that um, the American College of Radiology uh, says that patient selection is really, really critical and they offer some guidelines for pop proper patient selection for CT. Um, nevertheless, if there's a dispute about whether or not this is the appropriate exam to be doing for a patient, that goes over to the radiologist to field, right? We don't need to be championing, 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 I don't even know what I'm trying to say. We do not need to be, like, going to, to bat for the patient when it comes to, like, dose questions about proper patient selection. If, for instance, a woman shows up at your facility, she's 32 years old, it doesn't have any history of cancer, she has a headache, um, it's not our job to question whether or not a PET CT is, a, is effective for that diagnosis. It's, we, we can say, hey, talk to the radiologist and see if they want to figure out why we're doing this exam. Um, and a really, really big, kind of big, broad question is that when we talk about patient dose and CT, we talk about dose optimization. We can't just talk about minimizing the dose. Because I could crank the dose really far, I could crank it down really low on the CT scanner and get you crab, crummy pictures all day long, right? But we need a minimum amount of dose without, without compromising the diagnostic quality of the images. So... Let's talk about kind of some of the terms that we use for measuring dose. The unit of, of X-ray exposure in air is a, is a Rankin. I'm sure that uh, Victor's been talking to you all some about that. Um, and the, the units of absorbed dose that we look at are typically the rad or the gray. Um, so gray is going to be the SI unit. And there's some quick and easy ways that we can convert those. It is worth being familiar with these terms. Every now and then they do come up and we... A lot of times some reporting software, particularly for fluoroscopy, has reporting options in RAD or in gray. Um, CT, we have to do a number of conversions before we can get to those numbers. So, quality factor is going to account for different types of ionizing radiation, and in CT, the quality factor is always a 1. Um, and then the effective dose, it, it is going to attempt to account for the, like, the particular patient's tissue, um, and then how the radiation would be absorbed to that body part. So as we kind of unpack effective dose, we need to think about the dose geometry. Um, and one really important thing for us is that the uniformity of the dose decreases as the scan field of view and the patient thickness increase, right? So as the area that we're scanning gets bigger and the patient, the, the, the body, their body themselves gets bigger, um, the uniformity of the dose is going to decrease. We're going to have things like beam hardening that occur, basically. Um, and so related to that, body scans are going to be less uniform than head scans. I mean, a head is a fairly uniform thing, right? A bunch of bones with some skin over it, right? That's about all there is to it. But when we get down into the abdomen, we've got all sorts of kooky stuff going on, right? So it's going to affect the uniformity of that dose considerably. Um, this is largely the domain of radiation therapists. They sit around all day and think about this kind of stuff, right? Um, the central dose is, for a body scan, is going to be approximately one-third to one-half of the peripheral dose. What does that mean? Um, out on the skin is where we're going to start to see a lot of the dose, right? As we get closer to the center of the body, we're going to see less. Um, this accounts, nevertheless, this accounts for the organ doses. They're, being, they're higher in children or small adults, right? Um, because, again, that we've moved that peripheral dose in closer, right? Um, and there's just a smaller area to scan. Okay. 
Z-axis dose distribution profile is just a way that, fancy way that we can talk about the variations as we move the patient through the scanner. There's, their width and the diameter of the patient changes as we move along the Z-axis, and so the dose distribution is going to change. Um, so the total dose, and this is one of the things that further complicates things when we're thinking about how the patient's moving through the scanner, is that the radiation is, there's some scatter events that are going on, and so the dose is going to kind of tail off from one slice and move toward, so it's going to overlap into the next slice, right? Um, and in general, these tails of, can account for 25 to 40 percent of the total dose. So just this tailing effect of scattering as we move across the patient's body effect, is, is, is generating um, close to half the dose, anywhere close to half the dose. So it's a considerable amount that, it, that is actually non-diagnostic, it's just these tailing events. So there's a number of different um, instruments that we can use to measure this. Um, a multiple scan average dose is typically the, in the domain of the medical physicist. This is something that they're going to scan using a water phantom and an ion chamber and they're, they're using it to uh, make sure that when the scanner generates a scan uh, in the phantom, that more or less the same dose is occurring at depth over and over and over again, right? And they don't want to see any variance in that. Um, the one that we're, we use more frequently as technologists is the CTDI, the Computed Tomography Dose Index. And a lot, most scanners, GE scanners especially, Siemens scanners, will generate a dose report at the end, and it will actually show you the CTDI and one other metric called a DLP um, at the end of the scan. And that's what we have to, the manufacturers have to report back to the FDA. Now there's more and more things rolling out because of Affordable Care Act and a few other things that are happening where uh, federal and state governments are starting to require reporting of CTDI or DLP numbers at the end of the scan. Um, and these slices can be contiguous. So the first one, you're going to scan over and over again at the same place. With this one, CTDI accounts for the distance. It accounts for the dose over the distance. Um, and a CTDIW is just a weighted average over that distance. All right. CTDI volumetric is going to account for the exposure variations in the Z axis, in the Z direction. So this is going to allow, this is going to be a weighted average. Now we're going to account for the volumetric changes, right? Um, and the measure is going to be ex expressed as an exposure per slice, and it's going to be independent of the scan length, right? Um, and we use this quite a bit for radiation dosimetry, CTDI volumetric. And then the DLP, the dose length product, accounts for the length of the scan. So the first one is a volumetric accounting, and now this is just going to express that account over a distance. Dose comparisons. <clears throat> CT is a lot higher than X-ray. It's kind of like a no-brainer, right? I mean, one of the things the federal government has, has put out there, it, it, it compares CT or uh, to a chest X-ray, like a CT of the chest to an X-ray of the chest, right? A chest X-ray is like a flight maybe there and back to Paris from Memphis, right? A flight to Paris, let's say. Um, a, chest, a chest CT is like 100 flights to Paris, right? Um, so it is roughly 100 times um, the dose, uh, the natural background kind of expression of dose as the, the chest x-ray. Um, and that higher dose is basically the price that's paid for these rockin' pictures, right? Um, so that's kind of the balancing act that any good CT technologist is constantly kind of figuring out, is this the appropriate patient for this exam? How is this dose going to affect them? How can I get the best pictures po po possible with an optimal dose? Um, and then it's not unusual, it says, for the surface dose to be 10 times higher in CT and the average absorbed dose to be 100 times higher. Basically just a re-expression of what I was talking about. One of the reasons why the skin dose is just 10 times higher is that we're spreading it out, right? We're Tom we're tomographing, so we're spinning it around. We're allowing the dose to encircle the entire skin surface, right? Where with x-ray, we are just uh, flashing one side of the skin, right? So the skin dose is concentrated in one area in x-ray. In CT, we've spread it out. 
but volumetrically CT is still going to be a hundred times. Um, so, here again, the federal government likes to encourage us to compare it back to natural background radiation. And for Americans, that's about three millisieverts per year. Um, the most common form of natural background radiation is, is probably the sun or radon gas, something like that. Um, the exposure to from a chest x-ray is 0.1 millisieverts, and the exposure from chest abdomen pelvis CT is 10 millisieverts. And these are rough estimates. You'll see it higher and lower, again, depending on patient size. So, there's a number of factors affecting dose. We already hinted at how beam geometry affects a dose. Earlier we talked, um, earlier in the trimester, we talked some about filtration, the detector efficiency, how, eff how effectively the detector can, uh, can detect the radiation effects of the dose. Um, any kind, anytime we're messing with the slice width or spacing or the pitch or the scan field di diameter, all those things that affect image quality, pretty much directly tied to dose. Image quality and dose are really closely linked. Radiographic technique, it goes without saying that as we increase the MA, we're going to increase the dose. Um, KVP kind of works inversely to dose. As we increase the KVP, we can kind of actually drop the absorbed dose because it's just going to be going straight through them, right? Um, then patient size and body thickness is one of the big things. I mean, every now and then, um, when I was working in Texas, we would have people call up to see if this if patients could fit inside of our CT scanner, a lot of times they couldn't. We had a table max of like 400 pounds. Those people would get referred to SeaWorld. I'm not joking. Um, they had scanner technology down there that they could use for folks. Um, I don't know. I don't know how bariatrics work here, um, but there's probably specialized scanning systems, places that are tailored just to bariatric patients. Um, regardless, as the patient gets bigger and bigger and bigger, our image quality is just going to be in the tank eventually. Um, and repeat scans, of, of course, anytime we have to scan over an area a second time is going to affect us. Anytime that we're doing scans that scan repeatedly in the same place, like, like cardiac CT or brain perfusion studies, the dose is going to be significantly more. Um, and then the way we collimate, and that's, that's the, pre, that's the pre-patient collimation, right? the pre-patient collimation. So why the heck is this a concern? Um, CT is a really high dose procedure um, and people are really liking it a lot. Um, and one of the difficulties with it is, um, is point three, there's a need for education in this stuff. Not just for y'all, but for physicians that are ordering these procedures, for nurse practitioners who are ordering it, for the patients, for the general public, for government officials who are making decisions about this stuff. Um, a really interesting thing happened after the U.S. used nuclear weapons in World War II. The public response to the use of, of nuclear weapons was, this is so clearly out of our control. I mean, this is so, such a powerful thing that we'll let the government handle it and we'll just pretend it didn't happen, right? We'll pretend that didn't happen, the government handles it. So in science fiction movies, you saw things like Godzilla and these crazy kind of mythical creatures, like the man who's 50, 50 feet tall, because everyone knows radiation just makes you really tall and mean, right? Um, those were kind of popular responses to, CT, uh, to radiation dose, right? And we're, we're continuing those, that kind of popular mythology. Like I've been to, for instance, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. There's nothing there. We've not in any way memorialized the production of, of weapons grade, uh, um, of weapons enriched nuclear materials, right? I've been to the place where the Enola Gay flew from, like the plane that dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The building has fallen apart. I have a, I have a shingle off the roof of the hangar. And we're not going to do anything to memorialize that. We're going to let it fall into the dustbin of history, right? Because people don't want to think about it. So there's a need, need, need for education, right? I can't stress it much enough. If y'all are going to be working in PET CT, there's a need to educate your patients, the ordering physicians, eat your coworkers even. Um, y'all have probably seen it at the clinical site, maybe some inappropriate uses of dose. I don't know. Um, but there's also a need for appropriate kinds of research in this. There's a really scarcity of research. Like we're still comparing things back, dose effects back to Hiroshima and Nagasaki or Chernobyl. 
Like, why don't we have patient data? We've been doing x-rays. I'll get off my soapbox in a second, but we've been doing x-rays for over 100 years. Why do we have no patient data to pull from, right? We need to start thinking about generating that. Like, this generation right now is kind of where it has to change because big data is, is in the house, and we now have the means and the tools to record this kind of stuff in a way that's meaningful so that future generations can actually know this is what it does. Um, because we're still shooting in the dark. Nevertheless, um, inappropriate scanning param parameters have been found in some facilities. That goes without saying. We've probably all heard about Cedar sinai and the mess that came out of that. There's been stuff in upstate New York. A lot of the stuff that hits the newspaper is when these inappropriate or unsafe scanning parameters are being used, right? That's what sells newspapers. And it's extra imaging is really, really common. There's ways that we can drop the dose just by not doing certain series. Like, if there's ever things that we're doing that the facility just says, hey, that's the way we've always been doing it, question it, question it, question it. I think that's really the hallmark of a good CT tech is someone who questions everything. You know what I mean? If it's walking through my door into my scan room, I want to know why the heck are we doing it and, um, and how quickly I can get it done <laughs> so I can go back to play in mind sweep or whatever. Um, so, and then of course, going with the education problem, there's a lack of awareness. The stuff is invisible, tasteless, you can't feel it. Um, I could have a CT scanner in this room scanning all day long, we would never know it, right? Other than maybe the noise. Um, so it, that's, that is in a, in, a, in a nutshell why there's this concern. So, one of the things that we have to combat consistently is a perception of risk. Um, and anytime we're talking to patient member, uh, family members or uh, coworkers, we need to uh, provide an, an appropriate perspective on the dose and radiation exposure. Um, again, recognize the public may have a different, totally different perception of the risk. One of the most common jokes people say to me as a CT tech is, so now I'm going to glow in the dark. Right? No, you're not. And that's not even funny. It was a stupid joke five years ago. It's a stupid joke now. Um, what's going to happen is you're, you're probably going to have decreased sperm, you know, production, and you may lose some hair, right? And you may generate cancer. Is that funny? Like, is this funny stuff to you? I mean, is it really worthwhile for us to get this scan, right? Now, we don't need to be, so, time out. We don't really need to be abrasive or sarcastic to our patients, right? These are the things that run through my mind in an average day of my life. Um, what I can, nevertheless, I can take that as a learning opportunity for that person, and I can say, look, we do have to think seriously about the risks related to the procedure, to this exam, but do the benefits outweigh those risks, right? What are the benefits? What are the risks, right? Um, and again, going back, the public is going to have some really nutty ideas about what radiation does. They've watched, they, they, fig they figured that Cartoon Network is a perfectly fine place to learn about radiation and, or whatever. Um, on the flip side of that, we don't need to overstress the risk of radiation problems, right? We can really freak some people out in a way that's not appropriate if we overstress this stuff. Um, we need to find a balanced perspective Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the risk and the benefit is typically the way that we talk about it. Right? If there's a, uh, an iconic statue that should be outside of every CT department, it should be Lady Justice, right? Only she doesn't have a blindfold on. Right? She should have a balancing, a balance beam in one side and a baseball bat in the other hand. You know what I mean? Um, but she should be really clear-eyed about what she's doing. She's constantly balancing the risks and the benefits. Um, so the level of risk is considered appropriate if the, in, number one, if the individual is aware of the risk. Does this person even get it? Um, does the person receive a benefit? Were we able to make an appropriate diagnosis or rule something out that was actually life-threatening? Um, and have we done everything reasonable to reduce the risk? Did we use proper shielding? Did we use proper technique? Did we ex explain to the patient appropriately how the procedure works so they're not jumping all over the place while we're doing the scan?
Okay. Pediatric CT is a really, really critical thing, and again, it's in the news a lot right now. Um, one of the things that we should stress to the parents is that there's a relatively small risk involved, unless we're dealing with neonates, and then there really does maybe need to be an education uh, situation where we figure out how important is this procedure. Um, the procedure should be restricted to cases in which it's specifically indicated. And a lot of times if we're doing a good rule of thumb is unless you're in a pediatric hospital, you probably don't need to be doing a lot of pediatric CT scans. If I'm working at a general ER, right, and I'm seeing tons of kids come in and get their CT scans there, it's probably time to do some employee education stuff. Educate the nurses, educate the ER doctors, and remind them again, hey, there's alternatives to these CT procedures. We could be doing ultrasounds or something and knock out some of this dose for these peds. Um, every effort should be done to, to, grease, to decrease the dose, right? So there's sp pediatric specific protocols that are typically uploaded into every CT scanner. So the difficulty with pediatric CT is that we're seeing more of it. It's getting ordered more. It's a fairly high effective dose for those kids. There's an increased sensitivity because of their age, right? So the likelihood of them getting a lifetime cancer is increased. Am I worried about the 800-old lady that needs a CT scan? Not necessarily. Am I worried about the 8-month-old kid? Yes, I am. Uh, the risk of them developing some form of leukemia or something in their life is pretty significant. Um, and I would add to this special considerations a lack of information. We're working in a gap. When we've created the gap ourselves by not reporting doses appropriately, right? Granted, CT's only been on the scene since the 1980s. But when CT arrived in full force and the increased ordering of CT, CT now accounts for like 50% of medical diagnostic radiation exposure. 50%, right? So there's an increased need to report this stuff. All right, let's talk about CTing pregnant ladies, my favorite thing to do. Um, this is the stuff that really makes you question your job, right? Um, I left, I quit a hospital because of this very thing, right? Because there's stuff that's happening out there in the workforce that's just not right. I don't know how else to say it. And it's your job to be a whistleblower. No one likes a whistleblower, I'll tell you that right now. If you forget everything else I say today, no one likes a whistleblower, but it is why you get paid the big bucks. It is why there's a board test that you had to pass. It's why we are, have the responsibility to educate our patients and the ordering physicians and nurse, nurses and all that. Um, if you ever feel uncomfortable about the radiation doses that you're being, that are, you're being asked to give to patients, it may be time to call the ethics hotline to discuss it with your manager, um, to go through the proper channels to try to, stimmy, to try to stymie that. So, the radio sensitivity to developing fetus uh, is greatest from conception to three months because the cells are most rapidly developing at that point. Um, and the risk benefit to performing a CT scan on a pregnant woman is has to be weighed really, really carefully. Because even if we wrap the abdomen in, uh, um, in lead, you know, to where we're trying to block scatter from all, three direct, uh, all 360 degrees while they're in the CT scanner, there's still internal scatter events, right? Um, plus, we are probably giving them some form of iodine contrast if we're doing a CT on a pregnant woman and... Uh, and that has to be weighed in there too. Um, just so you know, kind of side, sidebar note, we never, ever, ever, if we're working in an MRI facility, we never give MRI contrast to pregnant women, ever, 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 right? Um, CT, there has been an increased amount of CT for pregnant women. And the, the, the main thing that it is for is for pulmonary embolism. Right? PE chest studies. So you better, if you're working in these departments, you really have to darn well know how to do a CTA of the chest um, and to do it right.
they're very stressful they're very stressful exams so here's some strategies for reducing or optimizing the dose we can use auto MA or adjust the MA to the appropriate patient size um, uh, again, when, when available, use the automatic tube current modulation. In GE, it's called auto-MA. Auto um, avoid increasing the KVP. Just keep the KVP specific to that protocol. You can increase the pitch, as long as you're not going to lose too much information. Um, and then use, um, limit the use of thin slices. Try to use the maximum slice size that's appropriate for the exam, right? And those are conversations that would need to be had with the radiologist and with a managing technologist, right? Um, but every now and then, after you've been in the, in the field for a little while, you'll start to get a feel for, why are we doing our protocols this way? You'll start to hear some of the techs having those conversations in slow times. And it, it may be a, a time when that needs to be brought to... Um, probably the radiologist who's responsible for how the pro protocol organization, right? And it may just be a matter of changing the protocol and you can spare a lot of people a dose. Rather than looking at an individual dose, what I'm saying is think about it globally. Think about how the protocols work on a day-to-day day -day basis. Okay, final slide. Limit the repeat scans. Yeah, it kind of goes without saying. Whenever, anytime we repeat a scan, we're doubling the dose. Um, one really common place that we can limit repeat scans is if we're doing CTs of the admin pelvis, like with contrast, it's really common to include a, um, like a 10 minute, a five or 10 minute delay scan to evaluate the kidneys, ureters, and bladder. That delay in most facilities can be skipped for, for young female patients, right? Um, unless there was a specific concern about their kidneys, ureters, or bladder, we can probably skip that delay. If we're doing it for an older person, go ahead and do the delay, right? But it's, we're just limiting the repeat scan. So a lot of times I'll call the doctor, the radiologist, do we really need a delay on this, right? You all will have options within your domain, too, to make similar calls. Um, before we even start, it's really important to verify that the CT is clinically indicated. Again, this goes back to are we doing patient selection-wise, are we doing the right thing for this patient? We can customize the CT exam when possible. Some facilities don't want you messing with protocols. Other facilities are fine with it. Shield the patient if possible. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it for dose.